Good morning, everyone. My name is Jen Hicks. I am the Director of Communications and Outreach at Maine Woodland Owners. Today, we are very excited to restart our late fall, early winter, and into the winter tradition of hosting a, a series of what, what's been called Fireside Forestry or Silver Culture Q&A. This is a really nice informal uh, conversation with woodland owners with our very good friend, Bob Seymour, who as many of you know, writes a monthly column for us in our newsletter and has been a uh, one of our touchstone experts for our organization, has uh, is a retired professor from the University of Maine uh, School of Forest Resources. And we are just really, really glad to have you all here and glad to have um, Bob's time to basically answer whatever questions anybody might have regarding forest health and forest management um, and silver culture. So um, we also have Jessica Lee, who is a very, um, she's a very, um, you know, wealth of knowledge as well. Um, she's very busy, so we don't really ask a whole lot of her <laughs> often because she's got a lot, a lot of balls in the air, but we're glad to have Jessica, you're here too. She's a professor at the University of Maine currently and uh, is a licensed forester as well. So Bob and Jessica both, and they both own uh, multiple parcels of woods in Maine and do their own uh, forest management and do their own learning <laughs> on, in the field, which is also very, so they have the the academic background, but they have the hands-on field experience as well to share. Um, and I'm just, I'm still letting some folks in. So those who have just arrived, uh, go ahead and mute, um, just so we have good audio quality, but um, we're also asking everybody to open up their chat box, <clears throat> ask your questions by chat, uh, entering um, information in the chat box, or you can unmute yourself and jump in and ask questions. This is pretty much, uh, an open discussion and everybody has a chance to, to bring their questions to Bob and we'll learn from each other. And um, the discussions are probably the richest part of this whole program. So uh, without any further ado, um, passing the mic over to Bob. Bob, thanks again for being here and leading this for us. Well, thank you, Jen. It's a, always a pleasure. It's hard to believe it's been two and a half years I think since we started this out of some well, March 20, interact with people yeah. during early COVID, right? March 2020. And we, <laughs> and we knew we couldn't do in-person programs the first right. so this is had legs. from you and just saying, let's do something online. Let's let's yeah. uh, let's use the uh, online arena. So it's, uh, we always look forward to this very much. I do. And uh, and I told just this morning, I'm always semi terrified even though I'm regarded as an expert, that somebody will ask me a question, I'll have no clue <laughs> what the answer is. And if I if that happens, um, I'll let you know and I'll try to get back to you. It hasn't really happened yet, but I, you know, maybe that's a challenge. <laughs> My buddy Ross Pryor, I see is on, so he'll he he emails me monthly about <laughs> some kind of um, progress report. So anyway, I just I'll open it up. Who asked the first question? Richard, I'm going to put you on the spot. Go for it. You're muted, so unmute yourself there. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Good to see you again. Uh, yeah. So, so the November newsletter, you wrote a an article about your feelings about your land and carbon. I guess would be my yes, question. yeah. And you were also on the committee for Maine Woodland Owners that recommended uh, that we proceed with a carbon program. I, guess. I was, and I am. I guess it's not over, right? It's a standing committee. So yes. Yes, yes. And uh, so that was well received, at least as I remember. And my question is the difference. I'm trying to sort out the November newsletter information with what I heard from the committee. And I hear it looks to me like you're doing something different or different criteria. And so could you talk yeah. to us about what, how you came up with, I, I call it different conclusions, but I'm not sure that's right. Um, 
Well, can we, I should first ask, can we talk about the main woodland owners? I mean, that's still a, a that's work in a progress, point. isn't it? Yeah, good point. Maybe just talk about your November. Uh, I was very informed by that, but I didn't share much uh, about, if anything, about that in that article, I, except for maybe the prices that are being offered, which are not unique to Maine woodland owners, right? It's any owner. So we signed a non-disclosure agreement. That's what Bob's talking about. Right? right. So, but I think we, I can answer your question with probably without um, uh, disclosing anything. I mean, I certainly was informed by that. I found that a fascinating process. And I think um, the two vendors that Maine Woodland owners negotiated with in the end, not initially, but in the end were, are the big players who only deal with large parcels like 5,000 acres and more, right? We, we have 600 acres, which is, you know, a, not a decent sized chunk of land, nine, what, five separate parcels, I guess. We've consolidated some land recently. Um, but in order to play, we have to then deal with the brokers who are the vendors that are dealing with smaller properties. So that, so there's fundamentally two kinds of carbon sales, as I tried to describe. You can either sell what you have standing as an inventory, right? And just essentially pledge not to deplete that. You can continue harvesting, but you can't harvest more than your growth, right? So you're pledging to maintain a, some level of stocking. And that would be the Forest Carbon Works um, company. They're the only ones that really engage in these long-term contracts um, for landowners of most of our sizes that don't own, you know, by well, what we have seven thousand acres or something in change in that, in the deal for Maine woodlands, and then we have the other the 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 uh, novel program, NCX, the the natural capital exchange, which pays you not to harvest for one year, which sounds like free money, right? Um, uh, they they actually didn't make us an offer. They said, I think, if I remember right, Jen, I think, is anybody on the committee on this call? I don't see any of them. Anyway, I'm pretty sure that when the RFP went out to all the vendors, they were, of course, included because they've revolutionized this carbon market by this new program. And, but we did not, they looked at us and said, no, uh, you know, we can't, the likelihood that you're gonna harvest X or something, I, I forget what the rationale was. Some of this is fairly arcane. They don't necessarily reveal all their secrets of how they do the math, right? So we're so I was so we started at the same time. I I just uh, and this was partly just so I would learn. We would learn more about the, the market, right? You only you the way to learn about a market is to go play in it, right? And put some for sale or buy or offer to purchase something. So. Um, all you have to do really is, is upload your property information onto a website, which is easy for us to do. And then, uh, as I described in the article, Forest Carbon Works, the long-term players, um, uh, sort of refused to play until, because we had an active harvest going on, which is a complication for them and probably for everybody, right? That was partly what the theme of the article it wasn't just about the carbon, it was about what happens if you're harvesting. And, engage in the, in the market, which was just a coincidence for us. Um, NCX, however, uh, made an offer. They, they give you these harvest deferral credits, um, which are just numbers, right? They're not a currency I was familiar with until I did the math. They give you, but they give you the conversion factors, which I did include in the article. So you can convert those to volumes that, uh, that at least I can relate to, like cords, cords and board feet and such, right? Tons of pulp wood. Um, so that's what I was reporting uh, on. Um, they, what was the number? Uh, something like five, $6,000 of, uh, if you did their, you, so they make this offer. We were offered six, uh, so many credits. And if you did the math on them, that, that, if you, that you have to then go into the market and, and make an offer at a certain price. And then they go try to sell that to in this voluntary carbon market. And I think what they said at the, when they emailed us, and if you go and look, it's about, it was about $9 per credit, right? So we had maybe $6,000 worth of credits. 
on all of our timberlands, which at that time were about 500 acres. We've now bought another lot for almost 100 acres. So we now have 600. That was yet another complication because we're now, right? So I had to then subtract, I had to go through the math to figure out how to subtract the wood that we were cutting at this Pine Paradise woodlot so that I wouldn't, so if we decided to sell those to, deferral credits, I, we wouldn't be overselling them, right? And then be in default. So we and ended up choosing not to do it for a variety of reasons. Um, and I'm not sure, I can go on, but I'm not, are you answering, am I answering your question, Richard, or is this? Yeah, uh, you are, Bob, thank you. And I had, I had forgotten about our non-disclosure thing, but I was just- Well, that's okay. Because <laughs> I was still trying to sort out the article, trying to figure out what the heck was going on. Well, Basically, I'll say it, it's I'm, a- I'm a non-forester person, I don't know anything about this stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> it was really interesting, there's, uh, so Bob and I have had a lot of debates about it, and I think that's part of why we haven't entered into an agreement is the- yeah is the discussion between the two of us as active managers. And um, on the, it's just one of those, it's an emerging market and for, for smaller parcels, it's far more developed if you have more than 5,000 acres, but there's two more programs that will be here very soon. The American Forest right. Foundation right. has one. Theirs is based not on your standing uh, carbon, but uh, but based on practices that enhance carbon sequestration. And it's, a, I believe, a 40-year contract instead of a one-year contract or 100 years. And then um, the other is Finite Carbon, who does have a large landowner program. And they're uh, also working on something that would work for small woodland owners. So it's sort of, it's, it's really like, when do you, when do you pick one? There's more coming. The market could develop in positive ways. It could develop in negative ways. And we missed our opportunity, but maybe the best opportunity is yet to come. It's just, um, it, I, I don't know. It's really in flux. So well, I what, consider Bob like a secret shopper by putting our parcels up there and seeing what the process is like and reading the contracts <laughs> and, you know, stuff like that. That's what caught my interest. I thought maybe I detected a, a degree of doubt because there, there's lots of articles out there about carbon sales. Yeah. Some significant doubters out there about whether that's well, important or not. So it, it, I it's it's sure a, I'm reading Bob's uh, stuff. We have we own our timberlands through an LLC, and we each have fifty percent. So neither of us can do a thing unless the other one agrees. Right? There's no majority interest. So. Um, the other thing about, so NCX, right, we had to then deduct for the harvest. It was fascinating to me when I did all the math that they thought of roughly 30 some percent, roughly 40 percent of our standing volume was subject to harvesting next year. We've now, they don't tell you that, right? They don't give you how they're figuring out even what your inventory is. It's all this remote sensing. It's a, it's a complicated model that they have that they somehow figure out your, your standing carbon stocks from remote sensing data. They don't go on the property. And then they have a model, it's an econometric kind of model, I think, that predicts landowner behavior based on all these factors, right? Like proximity to markets, yada, yada, yada. Now we've just harvested on all of these lots, right? So we've done fairly conservative, like 30, 30 40% removals on all of them all very silviculturally driven. So we're sitting there with really high value residual stands. And the contract specifically has you pledge that you would consider cutting those residual stands. They don't tell you actually how much. So I had to figure it out. And I said, we have absolutely no plans at all to cut 3,500 cords on these residual stands next year. I mean, we would never do that, right? Under any circumstances, because that's the, our growing stock. We want to grow that another 10 years at least before we would make another entry. So, so I couldn't in good faith, uh, I mean, who's going to know, right? I mean, obviously we could have done and gotten the money. That was one stopper. The other stopper for the NCX, the, 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 one to, the annual program was we're told that if you sign up for them, then that would rule out uh, deals with other carbon brokers like, like Forest Carbon Works and maybe these other new ones that just, just described the family, the, whatever it is, the family forest program. Um, and others, right? So we didn't want to do that either. I mean, there's, it's, so this is a real decision. I mean, if you, the, 
Uh, I can see people say this is just hokum, right? It's, there's no additionality and all these buzzwords about the carbon market for these annual deferrals because only 3% of main land is harvested in a given year, right? So, you know, essentially, not every, not every, the markets, everybody wouldn't go out and harvest, the markets wouldn't begin to accept all the wood, right? So, um, so that's, you know, that becomes kind of a non uh, starter for us, but then they, they're also the appeal of the one year deferral is that's where the big players like Bill Gates, who are who are buying these credits, they figure these long, they've come to the view, at least to some degree, that these long term contracts that were the gold standard back when this all started several years ago now in the, the uh, compliance market, not the voluntary market. Um, where you pledge, you know, you're not you're going to maintain these stocking levels over a hundred years and this and that. Um, that was the uh, gold standard. That those programs, yes, in the long run they will be helpful, but they don't do a thing. The, we're in a climate crisis here, and we have to do something in the next decade. You know, what's going to happen 30 years from now is irrelevant mm -hmm. to people like Gates, and maybe justifiably so to society. So I get the rationale for this. However, as I pointed out in the article, right, the, the, those credits are only worth, what, 3% uh, uh, or something of the pine saw long value? I mean, it's just, there's just a no-brainer of why you would sell carbon instead of, you know, roundwood products. When you get down to the pine pulpwood, of course, now you're dealing with something that's about the same value. But it, uh, um, anyway, so that's, that was our thought process. So we, we've done nothing. That doesn't mean we won't. Um, you know, one value, I'll just say this, uh, people say, and I, I'm, and we're both in this sort of same camp, it's like, why would we lock up our land or why would Maine Woodland owners sign this long-term contract with all these provisions where you're required to monitor, blah, 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 and it's like you have no, you have to do this certain level of forestry for 40 years or maybe longer, why would you do that, right? Well, because you can make a lot of money doing it, right? I can't tell you the number the main woodland owners is going to get, but we'll probably know about it soon enough. And it's a lot of money. Um, uh, and the Roger Milliken, owner of Baskahegan Company, who has uh, over 100,000 acres now up in northern Washington County, they were the first big player of a private landowner, I guess, other than the past McQuaddies. Um, his view was that by locking in a long-term contract like this, where he Baskehegan can never go below X cords per acre stocking level, locks in his legacy that he created of the past 40 years of excellent sort of long-term patient forestry, uh, presumably the way we plan to manage our land trust lands, right? Uh, for, the, for the donors that gave us these lands. And that's the way, at least if that's what we do with our lands, that's what I would hope that, you know, happens in the future to our lands, right? So it's the same thing. So we could lock in, that would be the upside of it. We'd make a lot of money. I think at the prices that we see right now, say $15 a ton or something for carbon, and I've heard much higher values, um, we'd be making 70 or $80,000 uh, just for doing what we were planning to do anyway. But, but also very constrained about uh, not being able to ever change our minds and then pledging to have to monitor, pay for monitoring in the future. And all these, the, the contracts are a little scary when you start looking at them. Well, I think that's one reason why the main woodland owners, we, I mean, we hired our own lawyer, right? And we've been, he or she's been looking at it for months. Yeah. Uh, I was gonna just jump in. Ralph, did, I saw your hand up. Did you wanna jump yeah, in? Yeah, Ralph, go ahead. Hi, how you doing? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Thank you for doing this, Bob. Um, I, I'm a little ignorant with this kind of thing. Isn't so you talked about these one year, this company that has possibly these one year contracts. Isn't the idea to not do anything, to not cut trees at all because the trees are sequestering the carbon? That's right. Yeah. Isn't it like are... totally passive? Like, so yeah. what kind of forestry plan is needed if you're not doing anything? Um, uh, you don't, you would not, uh, presumably you could have a long-term plan and just decide not to harvest this year, right? But, you know, maybe if you buy a forest or something that's relatively immature, that you could do some thinning in or something, but it's not like a high priority and you could just wait a decade 
and NCX is going to pay you thousands of dollars to wait instead of harvesting now, that in their view is a societal benefit. And it's, it's obviously true. This is the un inconvenient truth about this to people that like to manage and practice silviculture is that any harvesting is negative in the short run, right? Yes, we have long-term products, but you know, it's basically when you cut a tree, that carbon is gone from, from the ecosystem, right? And two thirds of it is almost immediately lost in emissions. And you know, uh, if the tree dies, it, uh, instead of being cut, it's also not growing anymore. So it's not sequestering anything. It does take longer for it to decay, but that carbon also goes back into the atmosphere eventually from decay processes. So the best thing to do is just leave it standing. And that's why you have this, the, it's called, uh, I've been tempted to write about this and I, it, is the, the pro-forestation movement, which is basically anti-management, right? It's just, it's like, we're in this crisis and we need to stop cutting trees everywhere. Well, that's just naive uh, in my mind. I mean, we have, Wood, wood and is a great building. It beats the alternatives, right? It beats concrete and steel. We all know this, right? Um, however, you know, if we can have some deferrals about this, uh, that's their rationale, right? So, uh, so that's not. If you were just, uh, there are carbon programs. My friend Mac Hunter, uh, you might have read about this in the paper. They just bought a, a thousands of acres, actually. Well, I don't personally. He was in a deal, but they. There's a uh, other carbon brokers who will will pay you to to put to do just this, put land in permanent set aside wild areas, never to be harvested, never to be managed, never nothing, right? And uh, what is that? The Northeast Wilderness Trust is doing that. I can't remember. I think that's the organization. They also would require a permanent easement on that land that that enforces that and all of this, and then they pay. You know, so that's another option for landowners. It's not something, of course, I would ever take because I, um, but very ecologically minded people, uh, people that don't like the kind of uh, uh, poor stewardship that they see around them, right? Uh, not all harvesting is good or, or even stewardship. Some of it's very exploitative. We just bought two properties that, uh, that were just treated horribly in my view. But we couldn't resist, right? It's got, they finally have a home. So, um, so that it's just a real mixed message out there. So, uh, so the NCX, I know a couple other landowners that have taken advantage of it, um, and I, they they will deal with even you know somebody with fifteen or twenty acres, right? I mean, if they want to, you won't make much money. Um, so five thousand dollars on. Uh, 500 acres, so you can do that math, you know, $10 an acre for not, for not harvesting on our whole ownership for one year, right? Well, that's like, why wouldn't we do that? Well, it's because I couldn't in good conscience pledge to meet their contract specs, even though it was not probably going to be enforceable by them. So this is a rapidly moving target. Um, and there's a, they're putting on a webinar in two weeks. And they gonna, wouldn't want you to cut even dead standing stuff? Um, well, I mean, I think uh, you can, there, you can cut, fire, there are exclusions, I think you, for that, if you're going to just go cut some firewood, some dead trees, or even your live trees for firewood, I think that's okay. Oh, We're talking okay. about big commercial timber sales I where see. you take half of your volume or something. Yeah, I think their their minor uses are allowed. Yeah. So the uh, I just want to jump in because we've been in as Bob alluded to that our organization has been kind of swimming in this and the uh, American Forest Foundation's program, the Family Forest Carbon or Carbon Forest Program. They're actually uh, I think part of their model is promoting um, carbon friendly management. So it's it's practices that you get paid for rather than um, not you know, not just the, the the wood, but also activities that you choose to do to promote growth uh, that will right. sequester more carbon. The kind of things I write about almost every month. I yeah, just, I exactly. Think. I mean, that's yeah. that's the one thing I, I thought you were going to jump in, Bob, with the, uh, you know, uh, Ralph's question was, do we not do anything? No, you actually continue to promote health in your in your woods. That's actually one of the well, most. Well, sure, yeah. But if you had, however, I mean, there, I could see cases where if you had like a 50, like extensive areas of 50 year old balsam fir that's a that's a time bomb and mm -hmm. and it's worth real money right now in that in the studwood market you'd be giving up 
way more value by, by taking NCX's money and not harvesting that fur than you would by cutting it, right? You wouldn't be, and the, it's, if it's gonna die anyway, you could just argue that it's like why it's not gonna grow, right? It continues to sequester carbon. Why would you do that and not just cash it in? And I think- uh, and, and there's calculations for, for wood products um, that, uh, that hold the carbon. So uh, it gets yeah. used in, as Bob was saying, instead of concrete, we use wood. That, there's, there's a net gain in, car, in uh, carbon sequestration um, there as well. The state of Maine uses that to determine how much uh, carbon they're already, their forests are, are sequestering and, and um, using that for their calculus as well. Yeah, it turns, I think the a group of us worked on, uh, Adam Dagno started this and then I went in and refined it, Maine's carbon budget. The forests of Maine offset about 70% of our emissions. Not completely, but that's pretty good. That's probably better than any other state. And, in the country. and that includes products as well. That's like just, the, no, that's just the, uh, that has nothing to do with products. That's just the, the photosynthesis that uh, mm -hmm. captures carbon in the trees, right? Um, it would include the harvesting, right? If we didn't harvest, they would offset way more than 100%, right? So um, to get into the carbon stored in products is a, is a whole much more complicated thing. It does include that, yes, because it, some of that is stored. About roughly 30% of a pine solid tree is maybe stored initially. And then, you know, that declines over time to maybe 20% over 100 years. So that's discouraging, right? 20, if all the carbon in a pine tree, big, nice 24 inch pine, 20% of it maybe ends up in a house somewhere. Same with a spruce tree, you know, in the dimension lumber market. Um, you know, paper's even worse, of course. Paper going to the landfills actually doesn't decay. So some of that stays around too. But there's nothing that beats a standing live, healthy tree, right? That's, the, that's what NCX's argument is. Hey, I'm gonna, um see who else has a question maybe uh, outside of carbon maybe jump in dick go I ahead could change this change the subject I, sure. I've, I've got only about 100 acres in norjwalk a lot, lot of hemlock uh so yeah just uh, the hemlock woolly adelgia how dangerous you think it is to central maine how fast is it moving what kind of damage will it do Ooh, i wish i had a better answer to that i i'm fairly encouraged i it, it doesn't, I guess I've, there are some horror stories about hemlock mortality down in Southern Maine uh, on Arousic at the whole research forest. Barry Brusel manages that property and uh, did some salvage cutting. Um, I think uh, much of this will depend on uh, how much warmer the climate gets. I mean, the, the, our colder winters tend to keep that at bay. If you're up in Norwich Walk, that's probably, that's better than being down in, you know, Kittery or somewhere. Um, it seems to have come into New Hampshire and kind of stalled, you know, hasn't moved into Northern New Hampshire. So uh, we're really worried about it here. We had the, our Penobscot Experimental Forest, a lot of the research long-term trials there that Laura Kenefick manages are, the plots are dominated by beautiful large hemlock and they're perfectly healthy. Um, um, we worry about it. We, one of our properties in Mariahville is dominated by hemlock, nice hemlock, which we left. And, you know, hemlock, we don't cut hemlock really much. We cut some last year, maybe a third of some big trees on a lot, but most of it we leave. It's not worth a lot of money. It's e ecologically very valuable, long lived. It provides a, you know, that evergreen cover in the mid story of the canopy that almost nothing else will. And it's very long lived without the adult, at least lacking the adelgid. Um, so we just leave it, right? That was while well, I was hunting this last two weeks. I was actually counting the hemlocks out there, especially when the snow hit them. It's like, boy, we have way more of these than I thought. <laughs> this mm -hmm. is good. Yeah, I, I have way too much as far as marketability. Well, that could be, yeah. I mean, but uh, it's, it's I, I hate to see them all dead too. <laughs> well, nobody, a really, yeah. Really mess. I put a map, a link in the, in the chat to the, Maine has a forest health division and they have mm. a whole web page on hemlock woolly yeah. adelgid and they have a status map and the, oh, okay. the good news is, and it's got all the detections from the original one up to 2021 doesn't even show Norwich walk on the map so that's oh, a good. that's a positive I have seen a map that came out of the university that's a projection of where it might be and and I recall it it I was looking at our 
where we are and it had um you know places where there's um coming up into into Penobscot the Penobscot River and the Union River where the water uh would maybe temper the the harshness of the winters and stuff and so that uh that puts us right in the radar screen there north of Ellsworth but um I'm not sure that it went interior except up up water bodies well okay well thank you thank you yeah. we did Another a program um with our with the entomologist who also did a disease report um and it's recorded and i'm going to post it on our website yeah. as well okay. so yeah. we'll probably hear about it again at the annual meeting right i mean they're gonna yeah. we just saw just on the same topic jess and i were just on a field trip uh down to virginia southern pennsylvania uh, the, in conjunction with the National Com uh, Convention of the Society of American Foresters. And we went, they, we were taken to a, a, a grove of old growth hemlock in w West Virginia, which is one of the last ones that remains down there, that 10 years before had been treated with the, the in, injected insecticide. You can actually keep, you have a hemlock tree, you want to keep alive, you can do it. It's, it's relatively costly, but you just inject it with insecticide and then you follow up by putting that same insecticide on the ground and the roots uptake it. Now this was done, you think about that, it's just like bailing the ocean, right? You might get, uh, you mm -hmm. might feel like you're ahead after one or two years, but it's just gonna be this perpetual uh, slow death, right? Um, but it turns out that actually that, those hemlocks are still standing there and they're perfectly healthy. So mm -hmm. it actually knocked the adelgid up to the point where it went away, apparently. You didn't, we didn't see any. Um, so that was that was a profoundly good news story, and I didn't know that that could happen, right? I I was pretty negative about this. Now, if you had a hundred acres of like uh, hemlock pole size stuff, you you would be it would that would be hopeless. You could never do it. But I think in terms of keeping individual trees around, if you want to pay for the injection, um, you that can be done. That's the same exact technology that people use to keep ash trees alive against an emerald ash borer. It's just like a an intravenous treatment into the tree's vascular system that mm. it, it translocates up into the foliage mm. and, in the crown where the insects are and kills them, right? And then uh, then they're gone. Now, uh, so that's uh, for, ember, for ash trees, like street trees that are cost $5,000 to cut down. It's a very economical way to keep them alive, right? Because it's much cheaper mm. than that, but it is nevertheless expensive. So there are trees. Well, I, uh, I'd seen a picture of a hillside, I think it was in Connecticut, with hemlock, and it, they were just all gone, just dead yeah. trees. So yeah. it can make it can make a, a mess. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think I have to worry about it in my lifetime, but it sounds so. And the U.S. Forest Service is working on it. They have a big. We saw the year before we saw a big research program down in North Carolina where it first started devastating the old growth trees there, and they're they really are working on it. And there's some recovery. It's just like the emerald ash borer. They uh, insects. There's some hope. These fungi are nasty, but the the insects. Uh, there's with the EAB. There's three natural parasites that have also been imported, and they seem to be somewhat effective. They may not keep the front from advancing, but it, ash is probably not going to go extinct. And I think the same is true with amlock. Colleen Terling, the entomologist, told us that they uh, they actually have not introduced some of the hemlock adelgid predators because they fear that they might attack other beneficial insects, um, which is their job, right? They're supposed to screen these things. So that's a so th there are people on the case here doing their best. It's just. Uh, this inexorable climate, warming climate, is just. People talk about how the trees will be maladapted. I, you know, they'll never. It'll never come to that. The pests will overrun it fast because pests go through sometimes multiple generations in a year. Trees go through generations every hundred years, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we grow them. So the pests, like the boar and everything else, is things we don't even yet know. The balsam woolly adelgid is a horrible pest up here now. Used to be limited just to the coast. Now fur just dies, right? It grows up to 40 years old and dies. Like it goes from healthy to dead. And it's clear up in Aroostook County. I'm not sure how far. I never thought it would be anywhere near there. Um, mm. And it's everywhere now. And it's just uh, it's just insidious because uh, you can't really, there's no management treatment for it, right? So we we had to actually pre-salvage a lot of that. You end up these patches of raspberry because there's no seedlings underneath it. Um, it's not mm. ideal. So we've had to plant those to make, get them to regenerate. Who's got another question? 
jump in or raise your hand, however you'd like to. Here's Ross. Ross. Okay. Well, uh, changing directions a little again. Uh, you had uh, mentioned about your 24 inch pine tree. Um, I get conflicting advice as how big you should try to grow your trees. Uh, you know, on one hand, I've never seen a logger turn down a 16 inch diameter sugar maple. And I've also had 22 inch maples rejected as too big. So what, what's, what's the goal to work for, for us landowners to, to shoot for, for diameters for, for our rotations? Sugar maple, red oak, and white pine, let's say. Well, that, that's really sad that you had only a 22 inch tree rejected. That wouldn't happen there. Um, <clears throat> uh, that, well, if you do the math on it, I wrote about this three years ago, right? And we, where we, uh, I, we measured growth of all the oversized pine trees that we cut Wikipedia woods in that timber sale. It was five years ago now we did the harvest. They were growing, I mean, white pine, for example, will grow well to well into the 30 inches diameter classes and be earning you lot, you know, five to ten dollars a tree, not per acre, per tree per year. Uh, this is because we get in white pine, we get in sugar maple and saw logs, we get paid by the board foot. So the bigger a cylinder, the higher percentage of that cylinder you can saw into square things, right? So uh, the number of board feet you get out of an eight inch tree is relatively a small fraction of that tree. Uh, a 24 inch tree, it's, it's a high fraction. It's maybe uh, what, 70 or 80% of the tree will end up as valuable lumber. And the bigger the tree gets, the more that's true. So trees are amazing that way in terms of being a factory for valuable products. The, so that, if you're just looking at the amount of dollars you're earning per year, and that's all you care about, then I, uh, we grow pine in the university forest right till the mills won't take the 36 inch butts anymore. We have to sometimes cut off the butt flare even, uh, square them up uh, to, so they can't, we won't be bigger than 36 inches. So that's like a 30 inch DBH tree. Um, and they would continue to earn lots of money even bigger. Uh, Robinson actually saw a bigger tree. They don't want them, but they can go up to 48. And there are people that have sawmills, of course, that are in specialty markets for really wide boards and everything. <clears throat> um, those same studies have not been done for Maine hardwoods, but I'm guessing it's, it's some of it, of course, is a, the species has to have the ability to grow well at a large size, and an old, which can be an older age. So things like sugar maple and spruce tend to slow down diameter growth more than pine at large sizes. So, but people, so the problem is uh, the, the trees, so that's, if you just, there are two ways to look at cash flow of a forest, at least there's probably at least two more too, but the two ways to think about it, I've written about this repeatedly because people get confused. You can either make money like, or you can make, a high rate of return on your investment. Um, but when the trees get large, you can't do both, right? And then the reason is like a 30 inch pine tree is worth a lot of money. So the same, if it's growing 10 board feet per year, every year, when the tree is 16 inches, that's a high percentage of its value. So your rate of return on that tree is very high. That same volume growth, on a 30 inch tree is only one or 2% of its value, right? So the, the investment might strictly cold blooded investment strategy would tell you to cut that tree when it's 18 or 20, 22 inches, take your money and then put it in the stock market or something, right? Which of course can happen if you, if you just, you're indifferent about investing in trees versus, you know, mutual funds, then why wouldn't you do that? And that's the way the team must think, trust me. That's why they, they can, they earn a high rate of return you know, the, the Wagner Woodlands and these uh, investment companies. But part of that is done by keeping the value, the base value of their land down. They don't actually earn much money. Um, the university forest, public lands, our lands, we're earning 30, 40, $50 an acre a year on our residual stands. They're lucky to be making 10, right? Yet that 10 is a higher percentage than what our 30 or 40. Now I'd rather make the money, right? I could care less about that base because we're not gonna go out of the timber business. And I, if you're gonna make a lot of money in forestry, you have to keep a high level of growing stock, right? You can't just keep hammering away at it. 
And it turns out, get good news, that's also great for carbon, right? Growing trees, large size, long rotations is, is a wonderful uh, carbon management strategy. And, and it's sad if you get into an environment like Ross where you can't sell 20 inch sugar maple. I mean, that's just terrible. That just means that there aren't any out there, right? Because the forests have been aggregated, I guess. Um, what I've always found is like, if you have trees that are valuable enough, you can haul them halfway across the country. When but I, they were uh, hauling, I know for sure Landvest was selling large 30 inch pines off of the Chadburn property over in Bethel, which has now been sold. Uh, uh, that that were, everybody knew had been pruned when they were six inches by probably by Phil Chadburn himself in the 1930s. Those trees are worth two or three thousand dollars a piece. Those butt logs on those trees it, for but for door uh, skin veneer. Those trees got all to Wisconsin, right? Which was probably the last plant that actually slices white pine veneer. We can sell hardwood veneer here, which is sliced, but I don't think they take any softwoods. So. Um, and they made lots of money doing that, right? So it's a myth that these that you can't make money on large trees. You'd have to do have to be shrewd about marketing, right? I'm not a that's not an accusation, Ross. I'm just you sometimes you're just stuck with a stumpage contract and you get what you get, right? You we don't as landowners have much power in this market. You're relying, you know, the middlemen for the these uh marketing decisions. But so I say grow them big, uh, but you don't want to, of course, grow something so big that it's uh, you should do the. You can do this yourself, Ross. You're a bright guy. Go out and look at the stumps and the ring count. Measure 10-year growth on your trees that you cut. Back that off. Figure out what the board foot volume was 10 years ago. Right. The difference there is the board foot growth. Multiply that by what you're getting for those board feet and maple, and express that as a percentage of the value of the tree at the beginning. And you'll figure out your rate of return. I'll bet you're going to find it's not, it's good. Uh, both in monetary dollars and maybe even in percent when you're, but certainly the 16 inch one's a no brainer for me. 24 inches, now you're talking, Forest Service did all these studies years ago and they would, if, if you wanna make 3%, grow your hardwoods on good sites to about 20 to 22 inches, right? After that, the percent return will go down, but the amount of money you're making is still high, right? Especially if you go into veneer classes, right? If you get into the, you, you get a 16 inch a veneer or larger log, hardwood veneer log, all of a sudden you're on a whole other order of magnitude, higher value. So something with high quality. If it's a 22 inch, uh, you know, grade three saw log with knots on three faces, then that should have been cut even before 22 inches, right? Uh, because that's not earning you anything really. Um, that's why we aggressively cut all of our pulp. I mean, we marked our timber sales. Uh, when I'm done, I want to see a straight tree every 20 feet. And that's if you walk around our lands, that's what you see. All the, what we call the Uggs, the unacceptable growing stock goes to the pulp mill because that's just not earning you anything. Unless you live on the land and you need firewood, yada, yada. Sure, leave some of that so you can feed your wood stove, but we got way too more than we ever need. So that goes to the pulp mill to favor the saw log trees. One reason why our, our growth rates in dollars are so high. I know this because we have plots and we measure, this is remeasure of trees. So there's not really any mystery in this. Almost nobody ever does this, of course. This is one of it reflects my career as a silvicultural researcher. I couldn't help but do it right now that I'm retired and have the time. So um, thank you. Who's got who's got a question? Go ahead, Ralph. So I have a uh a plot of my land that the beavers have diverted a brook and flooded probably five or more acres of it. And now everything is dead. And, yeah. uh, you know, I don't know, ecologically, is it better to just cut all that stuff? Like wait till the pond is frozen and try to pull some of it out of there or just leave it alone? And should, uh, well, I, and should I try to catch the beavers and get them out of there before they destroy more? Or I don't know what to do with them. It's hard to say. I, I, it, once it's dead, of course, the damage is done. And I think uh, ecologically, I think most people would say you better best off leave those trees standing dead, just standing there. They provide habitat for woodpeckers, other birds that are foraging for insects, right? If you cut them, then that habitat is gone. 
it won't matter to the beaver one way or the other what happens. Um, that would be a lot of woodpeckers. Um, yeah, I suppose. If you want some firewood, that's a good place to go get it. I mean, I'm not dissuading you from that, but if there, but just trying to clean it up, if you will, is not something ecologically that's going to be beneficial, right? And it's probably not hurting anything. It was just what kind of a wood forest was it? Was it like a red maple or was it cedar or was it what some kind of wetland forest, I guess? What species? Or, you know, or, I, I can't tell because they don't have leaves on them and I'm not too good at identifying everything. They were hardwoods hard. at least. They're, yeah, they're hardwoods. They're, they're hard. hard they're, they're, they did probably are red maple or maybe brown. I think, that, I think there's a lot of aspen in there and like okay. yeah. soft yeah. maple. Beavers are really nuisance. I think the problem, mostly the people that, the, the nuisance factor of beavers has to do with flooding your roads, right? Um, if, if that, if those beavers are blocked, usually they, they go and dam up a culvert, right? And then that may be all right for a while if you don't mind having a little pond, but then it floods, we have a big rain and then the water just pours over the road, washes it out, right? So that's why people put in those beaver deceivers if they, they want to keep beavers in their road system. Is this if it's a natural dam out in the forest on a small brook or something, then I mean, ecologically, that's natural, right? So, um, and the beavers probably, uh, it, it depends on what they have for a food source. Is the forest around the pond like a bunch of smaller diameter aspens, which is perfect beaver food, right? Or is it a bunch of big old hemlock trees or something? No, it's all, it's all younger, smaller yeah. stuff so under that's a, a foot beaver. diameter. So that's easy for them, right? Because they can just cut that and haul it and build dams and build lodges. And that's perfect beaver habitat. You're probably going to be, you know, you can have people trap them if you want them out of there. And that can be effective. But it, it's, again, they can move back in, too, depending on where you are in the watershed. I might learn to live with the beaver, you know, in your case. <laughs> well, we have, it's really interesting because uh, Bob and I like to have really diverse friends and are and that extends to people's feelings towards beavers so we have people who are they don't yeah. want a single beaver on their property they're gonna actively find a trapper and get those beaver removed uh by however that means we also have a friend who loves beaver and and the, her conservation easement does not allow ever in the into perpetuity the trapping of beavers and that's because they for her they have a social structure they have families they um you know pair for life and things like that and so she um that has meaning to her and so she allows the the beaver to take as much forest land <laughs> as they need but um but people people have it's it's one or the other it seems no one really is neutral towards uh, their beaver problem. I remember the BDN had a really nice article about a guy that learned to, he was in a battle with the beaver on his property, and then he learned to accept <laughs> the beaver. And it was, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. The, did, they're uh, really interesting creatures. There's an article in one of our newsletters a year ago or so, one of our members, Larry, um, he had a fight with beavers. His, he wrote the story about how he, it turned into a, um, a heron rookery. And he thought, well, all right, that's fine. Ooh. Wow, so, no, that's a that's a rare thing these yeah. days. That's uh, they changed the ecosystem, but it turned into a benefit. Uh, well, you know, obviously he he lost he lost some you know uh, marketable woods, but he he's people he talk about uh, you know we need early successional habitat. There may be places where that's true. That's not most of northern Maine for sure, because there's a lot of heavy cutting goes on. Uh, way more than would have ever happened pre-settlement by humans. But the beavers were the one entity that created true early successional habitat by flooding areas, killing all the trees, and then dying or moving on, right? And then that dam washes out. And now it's succession starts over from scratch on those beaver ponds. That was the natural distribution of that habitat, for sure. So um, the fact that these ponds come and go, um, is good sometimes, but sometimes they just last forever. Who was it? Peter Pfeiffer has one that's been there since he's owned the property 45 years and it shows no sign of going away and they can be nice ponds, right? Trout will be in there. So I don't know. I'd keep it, I guess, if I were you and you'd probably have other things to work, battle, right? Or worry about. Oh, I, but I'd be upset about losing more forest land. So then you, well, and yeah, up but if it those was immature aspen, you know, uh, if it was all nice ash saw logs, then I would be. 
I'd at least salvage, I would have salvaged them. The thing is it kills them pretty quick, right? I mean, they're going to they're gonna be dead within six months, probably if they're really, the roots are flooded during the growing season. So, yeah. Um, uh, but Bob, maybe you can talk about the felling of dead trees that can be very dangerous. So well, um, that's, if you do go harvest, yeah. I mean, you please. Yeah, I try to stay away them. from them. Yeah, if they're newly dead, then they're nothing, they're not different than a live tree. But if, once they start to develop rot up in the main stem, you, they'll kill you, right? Cause they'll just, the top will fold back on you and can come straight. You think you're going to fall it, right? And then the, it breaks in the middle and that top comes back and falls right on you and kills you or breaks your neck or something. So stay away from them, I would. Don't go out there, especially if you're out there on the ice, you know, not good stable footing and all of that. Um, just leave them fall. Okay. Who else has got questions? Jump right in. I'll try another one. I got to. Uh, sure. Bob, we've got uh, a big ash tree, basically, that's got emerald ash borer in it. So it's dying and it's hanging oh, no. up by chicken coop, basically. So we have the tree guys coming in next week to take this and a couple other trees down. You just need to get them on the ground, following your just most recent advice to stay away from it. But uh, it's a shame because it's probably got about a 14 or 16 foot straight stem on it that's just, just yeah. and i've talked to my neighbor who's got a, a sawmill basically and he's not responding but i guess maybe it's all going to be firewood but it seems like a shame not to make boards out of it but i can't sell the yeah. board we're in a quarantine area i think so i don't know what i do with this thing other than firewood Any um well somebody with the sawmill we, we my son and i actually own a sawmill uh, and we love saw and stuff. How big, what's the diameter of it, Richard? Oh, it's got to be 32, 30. Oh, huge. 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 It's a big one. Yeah. Okay. yeah you'd think somebody with a mill would want that and, and make some specialty products out of it, like bar tops, right? They, they really like the big white hardwoods, uh, butt logs. Um, but, you know, it's, if they're not going to, if you can't get their interest, you can, right? So I don't know what to say. Um, there's, I think, a network of sawmillers out there that, that deal in this. It's one of those little uh, networks that's out there. I don't know of a Facebook group that has them, but I, you know, I saw, I'm like you. I mean, even most port, I don't think our portable mill, which is a good one, can only handle a 28 inch log. So I don't think we even, I couldn't saw that. And that's going to be very heavy, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You could actually, uh, but probably too late now if it's dying, if it's near dead, but you could have injected that and kept it alive, right? As yeah. I just described earlier. Um, um, that's, but that's a sad development. I hate to hear these stories, actually. Taking it down was inevitable, I think, because it's just too close. Yeah. To moved a bunch of other trees over the years. This is the last one. It's, uh, oh, boy. Well, a 30 inch ash has probably two cords of firewood in it. So, yeah. and it's <laughs> nice wood, right? Ash split thighs. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> where, Richard, uh, where are you located? We're in Acton. I'm sorry. I can't. I don't know how the chat function works with someone. But Jen tells me to put it where we are. We're, we live in Acton, and the, the yeah, tree is in okay. Acton, and our woodlot is in Acton, which is well, right I, know I, I just drive past a sawmill uh, out in Fairfield going to Oakland. Uh, he has pine, you know, he's 30 inches, 40 inches wide pine. They yeah, have the bars and things. Labs, yeah. yeah, they yeah. are out there. Kind of yeah. Mm. There was an outfit in Gardner, I think they were too, that would come and take those trees. Now, the you're actually, if you, but you're going to, you hiring a skilled arborist to come and do this, presumably. They deal oh, with yeah. this all the time. They would be probably the best network to figure out what to do with that log. Are you giving it to them? I mean, you are they cutting it up for you? What's the deal? Well, the deal is to get it on the ground and cut it up. And I've said okay. that I'll leave the stem. I'm going to try to get my sawmill guy, who's done a lot of sawing for us. So it's not like he's not okay. used to this, including some big oaks. And uh, But I, I called him, and I'm getting no response. So it tells me he's, uh, he's probably not interested in it. I didn't realize you couldn't sell like uh, dried lumber. I thought I, I know you can't move, you know, round wood, right? Saw logs and pulp wood, firewood. But I thought I once thought it's it had to be heat treated, doesn't it have to be heat? The, the, heat treated? The, May, that could be. Maybe you have to write kiln dry it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Which is of course not something you're going to do. So. Right. 
Yeah, I don't actually know. That could be, and it probably is a good rule. That's probably how it got here in the first place, right? In some green palette from from uh, wherever. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we were one of the first areas that came across the border, so we were one of the acting. Yeah, one of the first two towns, other than way up in Augusta County on the Canadian border, to to have them the latch board identified. So. That's too bad. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We have um, about a minute or two left. I'd love to squeeze in one more question. Sure. Andy, <laughs> go right ahead. Um, Bob, I had uh, met you up in a lecture in, at UMaine um, a week or two ago, and I asked you about uh, hardwood planting. And you sort of briefly answered it. I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit, sort of when it's worthwhile, are there certain species that are more worthwhile than others, that sort of thing. Well, hardwood planting is, uh, it's one of those things that you have to do really well or not, not bop, right? You, there's no half measures. You can't just go buy seedlings from say the New Hampshire nursery and go stick them out there and hope they're going to thrive. Maybe in Northern Maine that would work because where there's no deer, but everywhere else the deer are going to just glom right onto them. So the first thing you want to do is make sure you're planting species that are well adapted to the site. We have planted uh, just what, hundreds of oak trees, right? I would say. Um, and it's really high maintenance. Uh, it's probably, we, uh, I think the initial one set, we planted a hundred, we bought a hundred tubes, they're very expensive. Ross actually came and looked at them and said, your tubes are, you know, intercepting too much light here, try these, he sent me some tubes. Um, they, so there's the whole thing about the tubes. You want, they have to be like five feet tall. They cost like $5 a piece, right? And then you have to have stakes, right? So the seedlings are gonna be 50 cents, maybe, maybe more. Um, so you're talking five, $6 a tree. NRCS will cost you that if you have an NRCS plan and you know, your forester, you yourself, whoever, whoever the, your TSP uh, is successful in uh, selling that to the county, right? You have to get the funds, not just put it in the plan. We've got some money for planting, right? I forget what now, but um, so oak is a good one because oak is, I think, well adapted climatically to much of Maine now, even Northern Maine. We're seeing oak everywhere showing up as our other foresters I talked to. Um, I would also, if we had cheaper sources of seedlings, I would be planting more chestnut, right? I think just, that's just a, such a good, uh, how could you not do that, right? It's just, if we had the, seedlings, but the, but the truly genetically bred ones are very expensive, right? $10, $20 a tree. So I might still do that. In fact, we have a few, right? I, I give, if you give, join the Amer the Chestnut Society and you donate, if you go in at the rate that's $300 a year, they'll send you four uh, nuts of these germinated trees in the, in spring. And then you can raise those to seedlings and plant them out, right? So that's $75 a tree. <laughs> so, um, and I've had, I've only got about half of them to grow. So that's more than that for us, but I, I still give them the money, right? Cause it's a good cause and that will ultimately succeed, right? It will win that one. And especially with the new ruling from the EPA, I guess it was about the, that we can now use the genetically bred ones, right? The, the, so, um, so yeah, and so, oak, chestnut, things like sugar maple. Max McCormick has planted about anything you can plant and he writes about it in the newsletter. So, uh, but things like sugar maple are gonna be even fussier, birches. Um, what other hardwoods? You might plant um, black walnut. Black walnut, it will grow really well, but the soil has to be very fertile. And, you know, if it was a nice old farm, it was productive farmland and well-drained, deep soil, you can probably plant walnut, but only in the in the open, walnut's very shade intolerant, it has to have full sunlight. So, so I, they only, so instead of, you have to think about planting hardwoods as what we call in silviculture, enrichment planting, where you plant, it's not like Irving's, you know, conifer plantations where there's a tree every seven feet, you plant them on a 20 to 30 foot spacing in small gaps and you protect them to enrich the, the natural forest mixture that's there, 
right? So you're just bringing in things that might've been there once and because of heavy cutting or something, they all got wiped out. Um, what else have we planted? Butternut, we have uh, butternuts, of course, imperiled because of the branch canker disease, another damn thing that's out there. But they keep regenerating here. We have big butternut trees right behind our house here in Orno on the railroad corridor. So <laughs> I, the squirrels will bury them in the garden. I'll dig them up every spring when I'm planting, when we're out there tilling, getting ready to plant the vegetable seedlings. Uh, up will come these butternuts and I'll pot them up and we'll take them out in the woods. <laughs> um, so you, yeah, so that's the other solution. You can dig wildlings, right? If you have a, wildlings are just natural seedlings, right? That have germinated in a place, usually like in roadsides or landings or anywhere really, um, that are, you would want a place that's fairly sunny so the root systems are healthy. I, we do this with white pine a lot uh, on skid trails. They'll come in disturbed areas and about three years afterwards, after you get them driven, they're about three, but maybe six, eight inches tall. You can, you go out in early April and you dig those and you just put them in a towel, wet towel or something, and go plant them immediate, you know, within a day or two. Keep, and that works. That that's, that's a free source of trees, but you still with the hard, but you still have to use the tubes. The deer would is, still find. Is it, is it worthwhile with cherry? Black cherry. Now I have no experience planting cherry. Uh, I personally love cherry as a species. My woodland in Kanduska that I wrote about, a, I don't know, a year ago, whenever, um, when we, I was writing about the rehab stuff, I harvested 3,000 board feet of cherry off of that 25 years ago, I think now. It was just old field stuff, eight to 10 foot butt logs, but it was, there were enough trees where I got really beautiful cherry lumber that now adorns our house here and has made a lot of furniture. So cherry, cherry in Maine, a lot of old field, it comes in on old fields, you'll see it, and it gets, it's really badly affected by this black knot disease, and a lot of that cherry that we harvested ended up just as firewood because of that, but it, you can get some that way. We have a few still on our properties that I uh, steward, uh, and I think, again, being a more southerly cent central hardwood species, I think it'd be well adapted to climate. It grows very fast. It's also like uh, black walnut. It has very in completely intolerant of shade just to be in the bright sun. Yeah. But it'll grow five feet a year once it blows by the deer and then you'll have a nice tree. So you have, I bought planting and I don't know where I would get seedlings. I'm not sure. I don't think New Hampshire sells cherry trees, but you might, uh, you might get them from somewhere. I mean, there's nurseries that will sell you almost anything. And that, there, it, actually, this is a crisis. We've been a bunch of foresters now. Are, uh, there's a big renewed interest in planting, just for carbon and a lot of other reasons. We, have, we haven't had a state nursery for, what, four, almost 35 years now. New Hampshire is really the last one standing in all of New England. And they do their best. They, I think, move about 2 million trees a year, but they don't grow everything and they run out. And, but with all this interest in increasing planting, there's talk of, of not creating a new one back in May. Whether this comes to fruition, I don't know. I hope so, because uh, our scientists, my my successor on the faculty, Nicole Rogers, has got a big experiment where she needs 20,000 red spruce trees. Where are you going to get them? Well, Irving, maybe you could get them from New Brunswick. But, you know, you, the, the time was where you could just, okay, the green bush nursery, which was just up the road from us here, no problem, right? We just get those. You put in your order and you'll have them next year, but not anymore. New Hampshire, I don't know if they grow red spruce or whether I would want red spruce from New Hampshire, right? Because it's south of us and it's a more northerly tree. You have to be careful about where the seed sources are. Let's hope something happens there. I mean, that would be, certainly be good for us woodland owners if we had a, a better locally adapted source of tree seedlings, right? So, great. Anyway. Mark, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for. Yeah, thank you for dialing in. This is great. I love doing this. We'll do it again. Uh, new in twenty twenty three, early twenty. Still haven't stopped me. Nobody stopped me. Even Ross. You know, you know, <laughs> next, month, next time. Okay. Thank Have you. a great weekend, and we'll see everybody on, on, yeah. on our next. We are having a carbon uh, presentation December sixth for those okay. who are still interested. Tom's going to do a presentation. Um, talks a little bit about what we've been doing, but also um, just general um, landscape of of carbon. Uh, forced carbon uh, markets and and whatnot so that's december 6 uh five okay. seven five thirty to seven thirty or something like that i'll i'll send it out on email tom is doing that okay yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay all right thank you everyone right. good deal Thanks, yeah bye-bye